Hi, this is Steve, and I want to welcome you to another discussion on Tech Leader Talk. On this video, I'm talking with Dan Lockney, and I'm excited about this one because this conversation with Dan uh, covers a very cool program from NASA that can help tech companies. So Dan is the Technology Transfer Program Executive at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C., and he's responsible for managing NASA's intellectual property and the transfer of NASA technology to private companies to help commercialize and make some of these NASA inventions that are patented uh, available to the public, available to the world. Uh, so Dan and I discuss what the technology transfer program is, kind of who it's for, what kinds of companies. And just as a little preview, it works for any size company. Uh, whether you're a, a brand new startup or a large corporation, uh, they license the inventions to all sizes of companies. And even better, you're going to be surprised at what it costs to license some of this technology, because in many cases, it's free. So Dan talks about some of his favorite inventions that have come out of this program over the years and have been successfully commercialized. And he also talks about a NASA publication called Spinoff, which highlights dozens of transfer technologies that are benefiting people here on Earth. It's not just space technology. Lots of these inventions, actually the majority of them, aren't involved with space. They're involved with other things can be done you know, <laughs> for the rest of us right here on Earth. Um, so why is this so exciting to me? Well, I'm a patent strategist. I work with tech companies. I work with inventions every day. And this technology transfer program, even though I've been doing this for quite a while, I hadn't heard of it until just a couple of years ago. And I see it as a great opportunity to get patented NASA technology to either launch a business or extend your own business with a new product line or something like that. So I'm just excited to share it uh, with other tech leaders and, and tech team members, just so that they know that this program's out there. Uh, most of the engineers I've talked with hadn't even heard of it until I told them about it. So you can watch this video and now you will have heard about it and you can see if this is a good fit for your business and for your products with the systems that you develop. So let's get to the conversation with Dan. Hi, Dan. Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So I gave the audience a little bit of your background and some of the work that you do at NASA, but... Tell us how you got to where you're at today. Have you always had an interest in space? Was NASA a dream? How how did that journey play out? So I'm uh, I'm fairly atypical in the, at NASA in that um, not only do I not have a technical background, uh, I also don't really have an interest in space. Um, and you know, I always thought that space was something that you were supposed to outgrow, like uh, dinosaurs or pirates or <laughs> children's things. Yeah. Um, and I never really had a fascination for it. Um, but I, I had a writing degree and I had an interest in, you know, writing things uh, out of school. And uh, one of the, the challenges being young, but having that skill set is I didn't have anything to write about. Um, I didn't know anything yet. And um, so, you know, thankfully, I, I stumbled across this um, NASA technology transfer um, and it, it turns out it's a, a, a source of information, just ocean of information. Yeah. Um, all of these fantastic stories of smart people being given hard problems, tackling those problems, and, and in the process developing new technology, software innovations, and, and hardware that, that hadn't existed before. And then NASA's got this cool program where we then get it out to the public and try to get into the hands of as many people as possible. So uh, being young and looking for things to write about, this was a, a, a quite an opportunity stumbling across this rich source of content. And I've often described it as like law and order, um, where it's, it's formulaic, um, but the formula is solid, and each story is a little bit different. And I, and I could watch a thousand of them in a row. Um, and, and that's how I found these, these NASA spinoff stories. Um, and through the process of, you know, exploring this content, writing about it, um, uh, I, I inadvertently, you know, kind of like through karate kid training, like the wax on, wax off, and all of a sudden the 
pretty soon he knows karate. Mm -hmm. um, I inadvertently, through all of this research and writing and talking to people and interviews and trying to make sense of it, you know, became um, uh, uh, unintentionally an expert in how NASA commercializes its technology. Um, so fast forward a couple of years, about almost 20, um, and now this kid who was looking for stories to write is responsible for NASA technology commercialization. And I've, I've got gray hair. <laughs> and, it's been, and it has been a, a fun and fascinating ride. And uh, so now to, to close the loop on it, I'm a huge space advocate. I think that our investment in space and aerospace research yields all these cool benefits. And, and all I wanna do uh, with, with my career is, is make sure that the process for, for getting those technologies out of the public is, is smooth and efficient, and then tell as many people as I can about it. Great. That's that's part of the reason I wanted to to talk with you to, to learn more about it and kind of get the word out there. I'm I'm an electrical engineer and, and always had an interest in space, but it wasn't until just a few years ago that I heard about the the tech transfer program. So hopefully some of the engineers and other tech people listening, this will be something new for them too and and a new opportunity. So tell us a little bit more about what it is, um, kind of what 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 kinds of inventions and the patents and what just in a Kind of a nutshell, what's what is the program like and how does it work? Since it's been around since um, the origin of NASA, it's actually written into the foundational legislation. Oh, wow. um, kind of paraphrasing says, make sure y'all don't just blast a bunch of stuff into space, but make sure it comes back down to the earth and practical terrestrial <laughs> benefits. So it's a little, little, little more um, formal language than that in the, the actual space act. Yeah. Um, but NASA has been doing that since the very beginning. You know, we, we get asked to do difficult things. And by we, I mean uh, the other people. <laughs> uh, they get asked to do difficult things. They develop new inventions, technologies. And then my office figures out who could use it, and what's the best method for getting it to them. Um, in the instances of software, we just give it away for free through software at NASA.gov. Um, uh, big inventory of, of free available software, modern real codes that our engineers are using today. Wow. Um, in the instances of, of patent uh, or technologies, hardware that we think um, have commercial potential, we'll patent them and license them to companies. Um, oftentimes there's a small royalty that we collect that goes directly to the inventor. Um, we're not trying to recoup our, our R&D costs, uh, but we're also, we, we give away technology to startup companies in the form of, of uh, no cost licenses. Um, so we're not trying to make money off of this. It's really an incentive for the inventors. But mostly what we do is we publish. We share the information as broadly as we can and try to make sure that, that people have access to it because giving it away for free is often the best way to make sure people get something. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So when I first heard about the program, I thought, well, this is just going to be all you know, spacecraft inventions and things like that. But then I've looked at the patents, some of them that are out there, and it's all over the place. What... Uh, are there particular technologies that it's focused on or do a lot of the, the geniuses so, at NASA just allowed to kind of run and invent whatever they are excited about? So it's, it's, it's all mission based. You know, we get asked okay. to do um, uh, specific missions and we, the, we plug along, plug along and uh, work on them until we, we bump into um, essentially a limitation in the state of the art. There's, there's no solution that currently exists and okay. somebody will noodle their way through it and come up with a new idea. And then we figure out if, if it can be used elsewhere. Um, and interestingly, uh, most of the, so we only patent for commercialization. We don't patent for prestige. Like we went to the moon. That's pretty prestigious. Um, and we actually got a great yeah. reputation. Like this, we don't do yeah. the patents for that. We don't patent defensively. Like we're, we're the government. Like if we don't want you to do something, we'll just not tell you about it. We'll tell you not to use it. <laughs> um, so we only patent for, and I'm, I'm being somewhat glib, but also that's kind of how it works. Um, so we only patent for the purposes of commercialization, and chances are that you know small U.S. businesses aren't building their own um, space shuttles or or satellites, and and we often would, and to this day still largely patent outside of the aerospace arena. So um, medical devices, um, uh, public transportation, um, uh, cars, airplanes, and trains. Um, we, we would uh, develop new consumer goods, uh, new safety equipment, um, and it was rare that we would find somebody who would actually use an S technology for our original purpose. So oftentimes these things get 
uh, translated and, and um, uh, find non-aerospace homes. So that's changing a little bit um, because it turns out that now in the past 10 plus years, there are companies making their own spaceships. Um, and, we, mm -hmm. and we give everything we can to them as, as much as possible. And, and often that's done through you know, sharing agreements and, and partnerships and testing. Um, and, and we're happy to um, share the, the benefits of having had a you know, 50 year head start with, with yeah. those companies. But largely the tech transfer is, is not aerospace. Hmm. That's interesting. So is that, has it always been that way? Did it, did it start that way or is that just, has, has it evolved as the, I mean, in the, when it started, it was pretty much just NASA in the United States. And now you've got all right. these other people. It's so the, the, the transfer part has always been non-aerospace because, because okay. there are people doing what we're doing. Yep. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay. What, uh, can you give us a couple success stories? You talk about like like medical devices and public transportation. What are some tech transfer things that have been commercialized successfully and are impacting people's daily lives? So one 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 kind of neat one. I'll, I'll throw out a couple. Uh, the, the blended upturned winglets on the um, edges of, of aircraft. So if you've mm -hmm. seen, you know, if you ever made a paper airplane, you, know, you blend, the, you kind of turn the wings up a little bit and they fly better. Yep. We, we did that with metal about 30 years ago and then patented it and uh, gave it to Boeing. Um, and Boeing uh, outfitted all of their um, airliners with this blended winglet. And what it does is it allows for um, steeper takeoff, uh, which makes it quieter above airports, uh, but also significant fuel economy. Um, mm -hmm. So we've saved billions of gallons of fuel in the, the decades mm -hmm. that this thing has been around. You see it now on uh, the, the patent is expiring. You're seeing it on, on airlines everywhere. Okay. Um, an, another neat one we did, and this goes way back, we have more modern examples, but sometimes the way technology evolves, it takes a minute for it to become ubiquitous. Um, but this one's kind of a fun and fast one from the 1970s. Uh, we had a, an engineer, an aerodynamicist named Ed Saltzman, who was working on the, the design of the space shuttle, and he used to ride his bicycle to work um, out at Armstrong uh, Flight Research Center, which is the high desert, just north of, of Los Angeles, about two hours. And um, uh, he's riding his bicycle to go work on the space shuttle and trucks would pass him and kick up wind behind them and it would shake his bike and he'd be like, grr, I wish that wouldn't happen. Um, around the same time, we had this energy crisis and President Carter said, any federal agency, if you got ideas for saving fuel and, and helping with this energy crisis, give me your ideas. So Ed takes those three things, puts them together, he gets to work and he says, Trucks are designed poorly. If you look back at like a 1970s semi truck, it was a flat face going down the road like a shoebox or like an upright sheet of plywood. And um, Ed said, you, you could soften that a little bit. Uh, so we retrofitted some box trucks. We ran them up and down the lake bed, tested them, and said, yeah, that actually works. So we went out to the um, uh, major manufacturers of these uh, big rigs and showed them the designs and the drawings. and. Um, to, to, to a one, they all said, I oh, know thanks for not interested. But by 1975, every semi truck on the road had changed its design and now it looked like the space shuttle. So mm -hmm. if you see a semi truck going on the road and it's got that kind of nose on it, that's actually the NASA design that was shared you know, 30 okay. or 40 years ago. Interesting. Hmm. So we've, we've got more modern examples. Those are kind of fun. A another favorite. Um, so, so we get, we have an interesting problem in that we get credit for things that we didn't do, which is a tough thing to complain about, right? That's, that's like, um, but people give us credit for Tang, Teflon, and Velcro, and we didn't do that stuff. Like Tang was General Foods. Um, John Glenn tasted it in his first orbit of the earth. And he goes, that's delicious. And it's like, yeah, man, the sugar <laughs> like, is really good. Um, and then they went, went gangbusters with the marketing and Teflon is DuPont and Velcro useful in microgravity for securing items they don't float around um i was actually a swiss engineer the, at the beginning of the 20th century okay. but but we get credit for these things hmm. something ubiquitous we don't get credit for is actually the the camera and the cell phone really? so that was uh it's an ass technology we still have the patents on it so your actual phone that you're snapping pictures of on your iphone your blackberry samsung i don't, I don't know who else makes phones um google um, they're, they're all, that, that uh, camera is an S technology. And it came from a satellite application where we needed 
and you can see the connections here, a lightweight, high resolution camera that didn't eat a bunch of battery. Okay. We developed a camera on a chip. First licensee was Nokia. Um, and we didn't get it. We, we were kind of confused why anyone would put a camera in a telephone. Um, you see, you know how that story ends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're, we're a little bit everywhere. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I remember the camera back, I think one of the first places I saw it, it was integrated into a PDA, like a handheld, can't remember the brand back then. And everybody's like, why would you do that? Everybody's already got a camera. Why, why do you need to do it together? It's like, well, now I think there's an awful lot of people that don't have cameras other than outside the, the phone. That's interesting. I never, I hadn't heard that that story. My, my phone is is more camera than it is telephone these days. <laughs> Especially some of these has mine's got two lenses on the back. I know the, the pro versions have three or four different ones. Yeah, and yeah. I've seen prototypes of fancier ones where they have six or eight taking different focal points and all kinds of stuff. So you can create these almost 3D images. It's yeah. really interesting. So um we also did we mentioned 3D, we worked a little while back um with the company that was uh doing 3D photography that ended up being uh the intro to um, those 3D walk around um, real estate and hotel room um, uh, mm -hmm. views. If you yep. want to check out a building and you can walk through it, that, that, that original camera, that 360 degree um, uh, device is an asset technology. Hmm. Interesting. That's a lot of different, a lot of the diverse technologies there. So I will tell you, I, I can do this for hours and it actually gets a little <laughs> annoying after a while. Um, my wife gets annoyed. We'll be walking around and say, "Oh, you know about that? She, Is it NASA?" Because she's heard this a bunch. And uh, no, no, never mind. And, and it is. It's NASA. <laughs> it's consistently funny. So, so obviously, you're, you you love the the technology and the di the different things that are being developed. But what's what's the favorite part of your job today? Uh, I like getting out and talking about the technology. Mm -hmm. I like telling people is and everyone's surprised. People are interested. I didn't, I didn't know that you know, pear farmers in California are monitoring their water, water usage using satellite uh, Landsat data. Yeah. I know that's why I'm here, right? That's, that's what I'm, I'm here to tell you about the pear farmers in California. And there's so many examples like this. We developed a ventilator at the beginning of COVID. That's a fantastic story. Um, I like that, that part of it, that it energizes me. Um, the other part that I find uh, fascinating is, is I'm a tinkerer. I like to repair things. I like, I like to find things that, that need work and, and figure out how to fix them. And part of this program of technology transfer being part of NASA's origin from 1962 meant that w when I took it over, there was, there was a lot of old ways of doing businesses and bureaucracy and, and what we've always done it this way. Um, and I was able in the past 10 years to automate and standardize and modernize and bring a lot of, um, uh, and I'm not going to say, you know, profound innovation, but it's kind of consumer grade innovation to the program. So now mm -hmm. uh, we, we've got all of our technologies available for licensing in one place, which might sound simple, but it was a big lift. Um, and then if you want to access it, the process of the forms to fill out are now simple and intuitive, um, like a TurboTax-esque, in that we ask plain language questions and accessing right. NASA technology is simpler and easier than it has been in the past. Okay. And then lately we've been reaching out to communities that you know typically hadn't realized that NASA has all this technology available to them. Um, typically we would see a lot of, um, out, so we have 10 field centers around the country, um, big national labs that, that conduct the work for us. And people know about Houston, People know uh, it's Johnson Space Center. People know about Cape Canaveral, at Kennedy Space Center down in Florida. But the other ones, you, if you don't live next to one, you might not know about it. But they're all around the country, spread evenly. Um, uh, and typically, a lot of the work that we would do was with companies you know, within 50 miles of those gates. Um, but now, through the democratization of, of access to information through modern tools, the, the internet, uh, primarily, we we can reach out to people and get the technology into you know, all 50 states, and mm -hmm. it's been a lot of fun to see. Okay, so I, I know one of the things that that your office does for tech transfer is a publication called Spinoff. Tell us about that publication. What's it What's it for, and what's the goal? 
So originally, it was around the shuttle era when, quite frankly, um, uh, people were losing interest in space, like before we launched the space shuttle, first one. And um, but members of Congress and a handful of them said, this is really cool stuff. And NASA is investing in neat technology. We need to tell more people about it. And they asked us to start documenting and putting out, putting out a report to them. Okay. Um, that's a good idea. So we gave this report to Congress in the 70s and figured out that, you know, more, more people than just members of Congress would be interested in it. So we went full color. This was a big deal back then. <laughs> and we've, we've since evolved into um, social media and videos and, and a large online presence. Cool. It's um, one of the most popular NASA web features. Hmm. Uh, and now, now our goal is to get it out to anyone to, who would be even slightly interested in it. And um, there's a there's a lot of traffic through the website. It's a lot of a lot of social media interaction, and the goal is just to tell as many people as possible um, that this investment in NASA and investment in R and D and aerospace technologies yields all of these great benefits. Um, then in, in addition, there's cool stuff people might want to know about. Like I just bought a, a, a NASA spinoff coffee mug the other day, um, and I don't. I don't quite get how it works, but you pour a hot liquid into it and it instantly brings it to a warm but drinkable temperature. Okay. And it's a delight, absolute delight. So you're, and you can you can dial it in so you get just the right temperature. These are former thermodynamicists from NASA who went off and said, we felt this cool material, we can make a coffee mug out of it. And it, it's the strangest thing. You can take boiling water, pour it right in, and it's immediately drinkable, but still hot, but not too hot. This then does is incredible. it keep it? Does it keep it at that temperature for a longer period of time? Is it like pulling the energy into the mug and then putting it back in to maintain the temperature? And wow. then maintains the temperature the entire time. That's Aren't cool. You something. So there's things like that that are that are, that are just fun. And that's something you can buy from the. Yeah, pick it up on Amazon. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. I'll I'll look. I will get one of those myself, definitely. And uh, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Okay. Yeah. I wish I wish I could remember the name of it. It, it was written on the cup of uh, the cup, but for some reason I can't remember. It's downstairs. Okay. No problem. So there's a new version, or not, not episode of the uh, spinoff publication that's just come out. So I will get a a link to that in the in the show notes. So it does have other stories and, and just kind of examples, kind of proof that that all this research and development investment is is yielding some valuable products. Yeah, this this, this most recent issue has about forty stories, um, mm. and the, it's a it's difficult to pick which ones to include. So we try to pick um, a, a wide variety of technologies across a, a, a broad spectrum of different um, applications, and we could write a whole book on software, but. I don't know that that's interesting to everybody, right. um, or maybe not interesting to anybody. Uh, so there's, there's a few there's, people. There might be a few. Um, so this one covers a, a, a variety of stories. And one of them I, I alluded to already, um, it's the, the vital ventilator. And um, remember, remember the pandemic? Oh yeah. <laughs> You're familiar? Okay. Yeah. So there is that Thursday, um, in March of 2020, when they canceled the NBA season yep. and Tom Hanks got sick and like, and then the world shut down, like it got serious. They went after Tom Hanks. Um, so while, while everyone else went home and tried to figure out how to avoid the dangerous air, uh, a handful of uh, engineers and researchers at the Jet Propulsion Lab in California um, said, you know, we're looking at a a, a pandemic, like a global pandemic of a respiratory nature, we're going to run out of ventilators. So let's see what we can do. They're not ventilator experts. They're just NASA engineers. So they figured out what does a ventilator need to do? How do they work? And could we design one with as few parts as possible? And none of those parts are currently needed in the current supply chain for building other ventilators. Okay. And within six weeks, they had a working prototype with fewer than hundred parts and had already talked to the FTA and had it cleared. Okay. So then it's incredible fast speed for production of a medical device, yeah. simple to make. 
Um, so then we licensed it at no cost to three dozen companies all around the world. Um, and the reason we licensed it instead of just publishing, giving it away, is we wanted those companies um, to have the credibility of having worked with us and that we could help work with their design of it and make sure that there weren't a bunch of bootlegs versions of like the, yeah. the fake NASA ventilator flying around, like a, like a shoe box with an NASA meatball sticker on it. That's what we call the logo, by the way, the meatball. Um, so we worked with these companies and, and gave them, you know, a documentation that they were using the real thing. There's 31 different companies, some of them in the U.S., and these ventilators are still in production today, still being used all around the world. And in particular, they um, are in heavy rotation in areas like Brazil and India, where we've got large populations that, that had had and are getting sick. Um, and the ability to, to access these kind of low-cost ventilators was, was huge. Mm -hmm. um, so that's in the book this year. And that's a fantastic human interest story, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's also a cream cheese. I'm sorry, what was that? And there's also some cream cheese. <laughs> we, we, you know, just to, you know, I mentioned there's a full a full realm of the spectrum things. There's a so in order to to hunt for life in on other planets, we we do um, uh, we try to understand how life grows in harsh environments on Earth. So we'll look in places like volcanoes and deep sea and in mm -hmm. weird spots and we, we found some um acidic pools in yellowstone some researchers at the university of montana work on a nasa grant in natural biology and they discovered a um uh, a microbe that was protein rich that grew in this acidic environment um and they they found a way to um isolate it and grow it in a lab and then interestingly enough it, it tastes like chicken <laughs> So you get this kind of thick texture of pure protein grown from a microbe. Um, so their first two products to hit the market are a plant-based cream cheese and a plant-based um, breakfast sausage. And I don't, I don't know if, if like me, you missed um, uh, the Beyond Meat company going public a while back and you could have invested and made a ton of cash on it. Um, but there's a lot of money in these plant-based meat alternatives. Um, and within the mm -hmm. first year of this company, uh, it's called Nature's Find, um, uh, releasing their product, they'd already raised over half a billion dollars of, of investment. So it's not, it's not just a fungal cream cheese. <laughs> it's a business opportunity. Okay. Fungal cream cheese. That's probably not what they're using in the advertising. I don't imagine, but. I, I, you fun. know, uh, they're, they're welcome to use it if they'd like. <laughs> okay. So, so that's, a, that's a great example. But what if there's listeners and they either have a company or they're kind of have expertise in an area, what are the characters, what kind of companies are, are the best candidates to take a look at one of these tech transfer technologies uh, to commercialize? We, we work with everything from Fortune 500 companies, um, uh, prime um, uh, contractors, like the, 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 the big companies, um, all the way down to um, uh, groups of students at a business school who see a technology and say, you know, I might, this might be my first startup. Um, and, and depending on who you are and what, what state you're in, um, and by state, I mean, um, readiness level, I don't mean like all, we work out 50 of you know, the yeah. US. Um, we'll find a way to work with you. And so technology at NASA.gov has our patent portfolio and our software portfolio. And you can dig around there and we, we've got it all written in plain language and organized by, by accessible categories, I think, categories, um, <laughs> like, like uh, medical technology, um, environmental technology, you kind of dig into where you're interested You'll see it. Uh, the name of the technology. You, if you follow through on that and click on it, uh, there'll be a picture of it, and then we list in plain language the benefits, the potential applications, and then it's like a newspaper article. And the farther you read, the more dense the material gets. Yeah. Right up front, we tell you what it is and what we think. What we used it for, and what we think you could use it for. Hmm. Um, then, if you're interested in it, there's another button. Click that uh, says apply. Or if you think that's a little, if you're, it's, it's uh, too aggressive, another button that says contact us. There's a guy named Corey 
who gets his emails. He's a real, real human, works at NASA. His name's Corey. And he gets all those and he gets them to the right place. He shuffles them around, and answers some himself. And so the, the reason I bring up Corey, he's a nice guy, but also um, <laughs> it's real people on the other end. It's a, it's a website, but there's humans on it, on the other side of it, whose job it is to help you. Okay. Um, we have a big team, got about 100 people working this activity who are interested in getting you the technology. Okay. So, so if, let's suppose, a, a startup is interested in one of these ideas, is do they get funding on their own? Does, does NASA have funding help? Do they have business mentors to help them if people don't have a lot of business experience yet? Uh, we don't provide funding because we okay. we're not really... Um, in, you know, putting our, our thumbs on the scales in the marketplace in that way, <laughs> we'll, um, we'll be happy to um, provide you the technology. There, there's some requirements to use it. Like you have to have a plan, um, a commercialization plan. Your commercialization plan should include you, uh, primarily your, your technical acumen for working with technology, how you're going to work it, um, and then how you get your funding and what your business model is. So you have to come in with a business plan. Um, we do have a few accelerators around the country um, okay. that we work with, not a ton, um, but we'll contract with a, a university or um, a, a, an incubator to try to get NASA technology and help form teams to, to provide business training. Um, but yeah, it's something I'd like to expand in the next couple of years. Okay, all right, interesting. So other than the potential license, does is NASA taking a, an ownership interest in the company or are they just... They they want the companies to get out there and build it. We're, 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 there's there's two answers. First is, well, no, we're not taking interest in the company. Okay. In in part because we're not allowed. The law prohibits it. Um, and okay. we're government, so everything we do is 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 by law. Um, but the other piece to it is, we're not in this to get anything back. Um. Part of the program, what, one of the things I like best about the program is it's, it's really altruistic in nature. Um, it's kind of re returning um, some gratitude to the, to the taxpayer payer and to the, um, uh, uh, the community by making sure that we're, we're getting the most benefit out of the technology that we've used for our missions. That it's a way to give back. Okay. Interesting. What's, I know the plan's been running for a while. Are there any changes or any new things you've got going on in the next year uh, to promote, enhance, or further the program? So uh, we've got this new activity that we've spun up. Um, so Tech Transfer, call it T2 for shorthand. Okay. We created a new program called T2X. And the X is either expansion or experimental or whatever the X and X-Men stands for, but it's just a cool name. So we've got an X in it, T2X. And the T2X activity uh, is something new. It's, it's small, it's in its nascent stage, um, but it's an effort to try to make inroads in geographic regions where NASA typically hasn't had a strong presence. Okay. So we've done some analysis of the country and tried to find areas that, that seem ripe for business development. Um, in particular areas that have uh, resources of uh, human capital, uh, maybe some research universities, um, uh, access to business mentors. Um, and, and we're trying to find ways to uh, make footholds in those areas so that we can okay. create a, you know, a durable and lasting presence in areas where, where we don't have a national lab set up. Okay, interesting. I assume that's easier than ever today with all the connected people and, and even remote workers. You may have areas that historically didn't have a lot of tech people, but now if people are free to live where they want, you've got some new geographic areas where they may be clustered. It, so. it, it is, it really is. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the, although I will tell you everything, when we start looking at the country and start talking to different areas, everyone says, oh, this is the next Silicon Valley. This is the next Silicon Valley. I'm like, you know, I don't think that's the best model. Like this, <laughs> have, you, have you looked at the price of real estate? In yeah. Silicon Valley, I don't, I don't think y'all want that. I think you want your community to just have a uh, good, well-paid yeah. jobs and some sustainability. And yeah, you gotta be able to live here too, guys. Yeah, I lived there for a few years, and pros and cons to anywhere you live. 
but yeah. okay. I love reading books. And one of the questions I, I ask uh, most guests is if they have a favorite book that they've read recently, it can be fiction, nonfiction, doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, I, I just finished, and I'm a, I'm a decade late to this one, so this is not hot off the presses, but yeah. um, Matthew Crawford's Shopcraft as Soulcraft. Um, and it's this interesting analysis of working with your hands and the, the problem solving inherent to um, uh, trades, as opposed to the, the how office work and um, uh, and what we call what we think of as kind of higher order intellectual work is increasingly becoming more and more just clerical. Um, whereas something like, and he's a, a, a philosopher turned motorcycle repairman, um, mm -hmm. increasingly mm -hmm. work, tasks like working with your hands and problem solving and, and repair and tinkering um, uh, call it a lot more problem solving than, than what we typically think of as the you know, white collar work. Mm -hmm. And it was fantastic read. It's interesting. I <clears throat> have not read that one, but I will add it to my list. And that sounds interesting. Um, I've got friends that do that and they're, they have different terms for themselves, but yeah, they love to tinker on things and build things. I was just talking to somebody the other day who's trying to replicate some of the famous inventions of, of Edison and Tesla and things and uh, just re recreating them and, and what they learn in the process of, of doing that. So that's cool. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah. So, well, I, Time's winding up on us, but I want to thank you for coming on today. This was, I loved it. <laughs> Lots of great information. And I'm looking forward to getting this out. And I hope the listeners uh, have learned something. And, and at least a few of them may, may want to look into this more and uh, expand their business or maybe launch something new. What's If people do have questions about the tech transfer program or, or a question for you, what's what's the best way for them to reach out and get more information? The simplest way to find us is technology.nasa.gov. And if that's confusing, uh, you can just Google NASA Tech Transfer um, and you get us. We, we should be the first hit. <laughs> I think we should be the first one to come up. If not, I gotta we'll work on that. Um, there's a contact us button. And so we got labs all, all around the country. If you click on the contact us or the network page, I forget which one it is, but it's a website, it's navigable. Um, okay. You'll find photographs of everybody and phone numbers and and we answer our email, we answer our phones. And the, one of the things I try to impress upon folks when I talk about this work is that um, we want to do this. We want to get the technology to you. We have a lot of people work in this activity. All you gotta do is call um, and, and we'll answer and reach out and talk to you. Yep, okay. And re real people on the other end. That's, that's great. It's becoming a rarity sometimes these days, especially with certain service companies that I'm dealing with. Um, that's great. And I will get uh, links in the show notes to all the different, you know, to the technology.nasa.gov and some of the other ones that you mentioned and a link to the uh, spinoff publication. So people can take a look at that latest one and see all those great stories. Um, so again, I just want to say thanks. I, I know you're busy. I appreciate your time. And this was fantastic information and very valuable. So thank you. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, Steve. Good. All right, I'll see ya.